Uh, thank you, Michael, and thank you, Sarah. And what I, I think as the president of the Canadian Nurses Association, just really want to um, reinforce the breadth and depth of the work of the Canadian Nurses Association in terms of its policy, its advocacy, its lobby, uh, those kinds of things, and the talent um, in uh, our organization. So I'm really proud of you, and uh, thank you very, very much. I think you did a, a wonderful job in a few minutes, really, to condense uh, you know, decades and, and hours of work. So we do have a few examples that um, I think people have, have put out there. And so um, I, the one I can see right now is, um, I'm just going to look here, but I, I'm going to go actually to the one that came in um, when people registered. And we kind of talked about this briefly this morning. And Michael, I know you've been a government employee. You work for the federal government. so. How does uh, someone who's an, who is a government employee, because um, the vast majority of public health practitioners are government employees, how does one actually um, do advocacy or work within that space of advocacy as a government employee? So I wonder if you've got any sort of tips or ideas for that. Well, I'll just give at least one major reflection that didn't really come to me for, for some time, Claire, after I was in the role. So uh, colleagues on the phone, I was in the um, office of the federal chief nurse for four years. And I think I, so I went from clinical, I had been the manager in a neuro ICU and trauma sort of setting at Sunnybrook in Toronto. So boom, into a policy role as a senior policy advisor, having never done it before. I think I was not clear enough for too long um, that I was not there to lobby my employer to take the actions I, that my profession wanted them to take, but rather to, to have a bit of a softer sell in the advocacy, which was to develop evidence, share evidence, be a funnel going and taking information in from nursing and its partners to, to inform government policy and, and in turn take it back out. I think I was too often frustrated thinking, well, why don't they just, why can't I just go over to the minister's office? And I remember um, our senior advisor, Stephen Leclerc, who'd been a deputy minister and stuff, saying, are you crazy? Because one time I went to phone the minister. And he said, what are you doing? I thought I'm going to phone the minister because I have this thing I want to talk about. And of course, because in a hospital, you would do that. Mm -hmm. You phone when there's a problem, you phone the CEO, you phone the director of nursing. And so I didn't understand the rules at all, Claire. And I think one of the, one of the things we, do, uh, we don't do well is we put, for example, a chief nursing officer in a province and think she is going to go there and just get it all fixed for us, where she is there to inform the government about how maybe nursing can, can inform the actions to affect the public. And it's one of the reasons we, I remember we were thinking when uh, Ms. Wilson-Raybould, however anyone feels about the outcome of that, was elected. She's, she's now a minister of the crown. She's not there to lobby to fix indigenous issues, right? So that when you get into those roles, you're not the fixer or the, or the lobbyist. You, you, it's a softer sort of advocacy. And I think I felt too much frustration about that for too long. Mm -hmm. What about you, Sarah? Do you have any? Well, I, I thought I would just add because <laughs> a couple of weeks ago, I actually received a call and it, uh, from the um, health minister's office at a provincial level had called me at CNA to um, specify an issue that they were having um, in the province, in the provincial health department, but that they were running into roadblocks at the federal level. So they had reached out to CNA as an association to say, you know, this is what's happening and maybe how can we work together to create change at that federal level and work through CNA um, to kind of uh, affect that change at that national level. So I thought that that was interesting that provincial um, health ministers' offices are reaching out to us to say we need your help lobbying at the federal government level because our hands are tied and this is all that we can do. Well, that's one thing Judith did well, you know. When Judith couldn't get some, she's a, I'm talking colleagues about the former chief nurse. She was there for five years federally. If she got, couldn't get something done or they, they tried to shut her down, she just went silent. She went outside, lobbied the whole country, 
said, I mean, you need to send a thousand letters in this week, and kaboom. Mm -hmm. So she got the policy changed by pushing the outside to push in without her saying the word. Yeah. So there's ways to get around it if you're, if you're getting roadblocked. So thank you, Michael and Sarah. And I've put in the presenter chat there for you a couple of questions that are coming in um, over the, uh, the chat line, the bigger one. And I think one is asking about what are the most significant changes that you've seen in, uh, in advancing ad advocacy efforts. And the other one I think is a really interesting one is what is your experience in terms of government relations or working with politicians uh, being persuaded by evidence rather than, uh, and there's quotes around, a compelling story. And Mike, you hinted a little bit at that, and uh, Sarah, I think you did in terms of some of your strategies. So maybe what are the most significant changes you've seen, and then what's your experience um, with politicians being persuaded by evidence versus compelling story? I, I think for the first part of the question about the changes, I think the number one change in regards to advocacy that we've seen is obviously the use of social media and technology. Everyone has a cell phone, everyone's on it, every politician is on it. Yep. So now advocacy strategy and government relations strategies, yes, they're about the relationship building, but it's more so trying to think about how to strategically use technology to advance your message. There is um, algorithms now where you can pinpoint to specific locations. So if you know that you're targeting parliamentarians in BC, you know you can pinpoint it to you know maybe um, um, you know the, the the Parliament Hill of of BC, the Legislative Assembly there, and target those MPs. So there are a number of different things. So I think it's adapting and familiarizing yourself with those new kind of technologies, tools, and then. Um, navigating how to use them. Well, the fact that you can just, you can almost talk online with a minister on, like they answer you. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, you know, that's a different thing, one-to-one, -one, or a movie star, or whatever, like it's just a very different world. Claire, I'll tackle the other one briefly, which is to say, um, I think everybody likes stories, and we've learned that storytelling is sometimes much more compelling than hard evidence, but the, the story um, should have the evidence in it. I think the bigger challenge is how do you overcome ideology? So you have a great story and you have great evidence, let's say, say, conjecture sites, and you have uh, Premier Ford during his uh, election campaign in Ontario said, well, I, I wouldn't want someone I love going into a, basically I'm paraphrasing, but it's, it's recorded. I wouldn't want someone I love going there just shooting up and getting sicker. I just don't believe it. So all the best, all the most, uh, the best idea, or excuse me, evidence and story didn't overcome it. Donald Trump um, didn't believe the International Panel on Climate Change and asked his own people to produce the climate change report, which they did, and he re and they brought it back to him, and he, it is, it's in the cover of the paper. Um, well, I just don't believe it. I read some of it, but I don't believe it. So for. <laughs> For me, Claire, the, the thing that I find the very hardest is how do we understand and overcome ideology. Um, that's the bigger challenge for me. And that's, thank you. That's, uh, that was also a question in the chat box, and I think that's things that uh, many of us uh, in public health uh, face that uh, frustration uh, every day. So I'm going to move along and uh, uh, just wrap up uh, for today. Thank you again. Uh, so much, uh, Sarah and Michael, and thank you everybody for attending today and staying with us. Um, I just really want to uh, point to a link, and ASHACOR will send that out to you as well, uh, in terms of uh, our evaluation. Your feedback is really, really important to you, um, or to us, so please complete that evaluation. We do take uh, what you say very, very seriously. And uh, stay in touch with us at the NCCDH, but also stay in touch with us within the Canadian Nurses Association. And uh, I know that Michael and Sarah, um, you can write, write to the uh, website if you want and ask them questions. And uh, they, they obviously love to talk about um, uh, government relations and advocacy and uh, policy efforts. Thanks to ASHACOR for your wonderful uh, uh, hosting here and the technological or the technology support. Thank you, everybody. We're going to sign off now.